Christ is born in Bethlehem by Alice Corbin Henderson. Read for LibriVox.org by Chad Horner. Located in Liverpool, England. A New Mexico nursery rhyme. Cristo Nathio is what the rooster said. And the hen said, In Berlin. The goats were so curious that they said, From us a ver, let us go see. But the wise old sheep said, no es minister. There's no need of it. Cristo Nathio. In Berlin. Vamos a ver. No es minister. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Christmas by Aline Kilmer. Read for LibriVox.org by Sam Bartle. And shall you have a tree, they say. Now one is dead and one away. Oh, I shall have a Christmas tree, brighter than ever it shall be, dressed out with coloured lights to make the room all glorious for your sake, and under the tree a child shall sleep, near shepherds watching their wooden sheep, threads of silver and nets of gold, scarlet bubbles the tree shall hold, and little glass bells that tinkle clear, I shall trim it alone, but feel you near. And when Christmas Day is almost done, When they all grow sleepy one by one, When Kenton's books have all been read, When Deborah's climbing the stairs to bed, I shall sit alone by the fire and see Ghosts of you both come close to me, For the dead and the absent always stay With the one they love on Christmas Day. End of poem this recording is in the public domain. Christmas Bells by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow Read for LibriVox.org by Ike Scher. I heard the bells on Christmas Day Their old familiar carols play And wild and sweet the words repeat Of peace on earth, goodwill to men and thought how, as the day had come, the bellfires of all Christendom had rolled along the unbroken song of peace on earth, good will to men. Till ringing, singing on its way, the world revolved from night to day. A voice, a chime, a chant sublime of peace on earth, good will to men. Then, from each black, accursed mouth, the cannon thundered in the south, and with the sound the carols drowned of peace on earth, good will to men. It was as if an earthquake rent the hearth stones of a continent, and made forlorn the houses born of peace on earth, good will to men. And in despair I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said, For hate is strong and mocks the song Of peace on earth, good will to men. Then pealed the bells more loud and deep, God is not dead, nor doth he sleep, The wrong shall fail, the right prevail, With peace on earth, good will to men. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Christmas Carol by Gilbert Keith Chesterton Read for LibriVox.org by Ike Scher The Christ child lay on Mary's lap, his hair was like a light. Oh, weary! Weary were the world, but here is all aright. The Christ child lay on Mary's breast, his hair was like a star. Oh, stern and cunning are the kings, but here the true hearts are. The Christ child lay on Mary's heart, his hair was like a fire. Oh, weary! Where is the world? But here 
the world's desire. The Christ child stood at Mary's knee. His hair was like a crown. And all the flowers looked up at him. And all the stars looked down. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Church Sociable by Jean Starr Untermeyer Read for LibriVox.org by Jen Warren Isn't it quaint, he turned and said to me, to watch these village people at the fair? But I had seen too often what was there. I shrugged in patience at his sympathy. I was a child again, and Mrs. Lee, and other members of the ladies' aid, at tables on the lawn, a meek parade were serving cakes and glasses of iced tea. I hated this weak pomp of charity, this pauper feast to aid the stricken poor. I watched these two thin ladies seek their door in sweetly pious insincerity, holding themselves so righteously alone, turning their Christian backs on Mrs. Cohen. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Clay Hills by Jean Starr Untermeyer Read for LibriVox.org by Jen Warren It is easy to mold the yielding clay, and many shapes grow into beauty under the facile hand. But forms of clay are lightly broken, they will lie shattered and forgotten in a dingy corner. But underneath the slipping clay is rock. I would rather work in stubborn rock all the years of my life, and make one strong thing and set it in a high, clean place to recall the granite strength of my desire. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Clear Midnight by Walt Whitman Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp This is thy hour, O soul, thy free flight into the wordless, Away from books, away from art, The day erased, the lesson done. Thee, fully forth emerging, Silent, gazing, Pondering the themes thou lovest best, Night, sleep, and the stars. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Come, Come, Thou Bleak December Wind by Samuel Taylor Coleridge Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp Come, come, thou bleak December wind, and blow the dry leaves from the tree. Flash like a love thought through me, death, and take a life that wearies me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. December Snow by Effie Smith Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson The falling snow a stainless veil doth cast Upon the relics of the dying year, Dead leaves and withered flowers, And stubble sere, As if it would erase the faded past. So on our lives doth death descend at last, Hiding youth's hopes and manhood's purpose clear, And memories faint to dreaming age most dear, Beneath its silence, blank and white and vast. The sun shines out, and lo, the meadows lone Flash into sudden splendor, strangely bright, More fair than summer landscape ever shone. Thus gleaming through the storm clouds, Faith's clear light transforms death's endless waste of silence white to beauty passing all that life has known. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Dot by J. Ashby Sterry. Read for LibriVox.org by Ted Hanlon. Oh, had I but a fairy yacht. I know quite well what I would do. I soon would sail away with Dot. 
I'd quickly weave a cunning plot, had I but fairies for my crew, oh had I but a fairy yacht, I'd soon be off just like a shot, far far across the ocean blue, I soon would sail away with Dot. What happiness would be my lot, with naught to do all day but woo, oh had I but a fairy yacht. To some sweet unfrequented spot, if I but thought that hearts were true, I soon would sail away with Dot. I'd sail away not minding what my friends approve or foes poo-poo, oh had I but a fairy yacht. For name or fame care not a jot, I'd leave behind no trace or clue, I soon would sail away with Dot. Forgetting all by all forgot, I'd live and love the whole day through, oh had I but a fairy yacht. In distant lands I'd build a cot, and live alone with I know who, I soon would sail away with Dot. I'd start at once, oh would I not, if I were only twenty-two, Oh, had I but a fairy yacht, I soon would sail away with Dot. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Fallen Cities by Gerald Gould Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk I gathered with a careless hand There where the waters night and day Are languid in the idle bay A little heap of golden sand And as I saw it in my sight Awoke a vision brief and bright A city in a pleasant land I saw no mound of earth But fair turrets and domes and citadels With murmuring of many bells The spires were white in the blue air and men by thousands went and came, rapid and restless, and like flame, blown by their passions here and there. With careless hand I swept away the little mound before I knew, the vision city vanished too, and fallen beneath my fingers lay. Ah, God, how many hast thou seen, cities that are not and have been by silent hill and idle bay end of poem this recording is in the public domain ghosts by margaret louisa woods read for librivox.org by newgate novelist where the columned cliffs far out have planted their daring shafts in the northern foam, there hangs a castle that should be haunted, a ruin meet for a phantom's home. For heavily in the caverns under, the hidden tide, like a muffled drum, beats distinct through the level thunder of the wintry waste whence storm winds come. And fire has blackened the mouldering rafter, And stairs have crumbled from bolted doors. At night there's a sound of wail and laughter, And footsteps crossing the creaking floors. And in and out, through the courts forsaken, Wild shapes are drifted from hall to hall. With a trumpet sound the towers are shaken, and banners flutter along the wall. Tis but the storms and the seas enchant it. Its ghosts are shadow and wind and spray, if ever a phantom used to haunt it. That too was mortal, and passed away. The ghosts have found where the hills in bosom a windless garden, they walk at noon, when the beds and branches burn with blossom, and hardly wait for the rising moon, when the starry charm of the night is broken, and the day but lives as a child unborn. They pass with echoes of words once spoken, and silent footsteps and eyes forlorn. 
from the blind grey house where all are sleeping a mocking music sounds wild and clear the faint lights glimmer and past them sweeping the dancers appear and disappear and the swinging branches close to cover the two who tremble there heart to heart the ghostly lady and phantom lover the souls long parted that cannot part they seem as shadows of morn and even forever fading to come again they are as shadows of tempest driven stormily sighing across the plain for these depart as the rest departed the garden under the hill shall be as ghost forsaken as past deserted as the castle over the northern sea end of poem this recording is in the public domain God's Judgment on a Wicked Bishop by Robert Southey Read for LibriVox.org by M. Lee The summer and autumn had been so wet That in winter the corn was growing yet T'was a piteous sight to see all round The grain lie rotting on the ground Every day the starving poor Crowded round Bishop Hatto's door for he had a plentiful last year's store and all the neighbourhood could tell his granaries were furnished well at last bishop hatto appointed a day to quiet the poor without delay he bade them to his great barn repair and they should have food for the winter there rejoiced the tidings good to hear the poor folk flocked from far and near the great barn was full as it could hold of women and children and young and old then when he saw it could hold no more bishop hatto he made fast the door and while for mercy on christ they call he set fire to the barn and burnt them all in faith tis an excellent bonfire quoth he and the country is greatly obliged to me for ridding it in these times forlorn of rats that only consume the corn so then to his palace returned he and he sat down to supper merrily and he slept that night like an innocent man but bishop hatto never slept again in the morning as he entered the hall where his picture hung against the wall a sweat like death all over him came for the rats had eaten it out of the frame as he looked there came a man from his farm he had a countenance white with alarm my lord i opened your granaries this morn and the rats had eaten all your corn another came running presently and he was pale as pale could be fly my lord bishop fly quoth he ten thousand rats are coming this way the lord forgive you for yesterday i'll go to my tower on the rhine replied he tis the safest place in germany the walls are high and the shores are steep and the stream is strong and the water deep bishop hatto fearfully hastened away and he crossed the rhine without delay and reached his tower and barred with care all the windows doors and loopholes there he laid him down and closed his eyes but soon a scream made him arise he started and saw two eyes of flame on his pillow from whence the screaming came he listened and looked it was only the cat but the bishop he grew more fearful for that for she sat screaming mad with fear at the army of rats that were drawing near for they have swum over the river so deep and they have climbed the shores so steep and up the tower their way is bent to do the work for which they were sent they are not to be told by the dozen or score 
by thousands they come and by myriads and more such numbers had never been heard of before such a judgment had never been witnessed of yore down on his knees the bishop fell and faster and faster his beads did he tell as louder and louder drawing near the gnawing of their teeth he could hear and in at the windows and in at the door and through the walls helter skelter they pour and down from the ceiling and up through the floor from the right and the left from behind and before from within and without from above and below and all at once to the bishop they go they have whetted their teeth against the stones and now they pick the bishop's bones they gnawed the flesh from every limb for they were sent to do judgment on him and a poem this recording is in the public domain God's Message to Men by Ralph Waldo Emerson Read for LibriVox.org God's Message to Men God said, I am tired of kings, I suffer them no more. Up to my ear the morning brings the outrage of the poor. Think ye I have made this ball a field of havoc and war, where tyrants great and tyrants small might harry the weak and poor? My angel, his name is Freedom. Choose him to be your king. He shall cut pathways east and west and fend you with his wing. I will never have a noble, no lineage counted great. Fishers and choppers and plowmen shall constitute a state and ye shall succor man tis nobleness to serve help them who cannot help again beware from right to swerve end of poem this recording is in the public domain the hall of memory by thomas hall shastet read for LibriVox.org by andrew gauntz there is a hall of memory within a happy land. The walls are high and marble clear with wealth on every hand. The railings on the stairway are made of purest gold. The marble steps below them are hard and stern and cold. I love the hall of memory. I love to linger there. Sweet visions coming evermore, its pictures bright and fair. Its walls are decked with pictures made by a master's hand. The marble figures far and near alive they seem to stand. But there is one fair picture I love to gaze upon. It is the picture of a time that is forever gone. There is a hall of memory. Its walls are stern and high. The treasures it contains for me no wealth can ever buy. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Haunted House by Thomas Hall Shasted. Read for LibriVox.org by Andrew Gauntz. See the grass upon its threshold, see the ivy on its wall. Vacant are its crumbling windows, vacant is its mossy hall. Ah, the step of man upon it shall resound along no more, For the spirits of the dead ones ever flit about the door. There the whisperings of the voices of the spirits of the dead, Those of friends and enemies ever murmur round your head. Let us leave the haunted ruin, spirits walk the crumbling floor, Light their step, but oh, their voices haunt the building evermore. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. He Who Has Vision by Folger Mackenzie, 1866-1910 Read for LibriVox.org He Who Has Vision where there is no vision, the people perish. 
Proverbs 29.17 He who has the vision sees more than you or I. He who lives the golden dream lives fourfold thereby. Time may scoff and worlds may laugh. Hosts assail his thought. But the visionary came ere the builders wrought. Ere the tower bestrode the dome. Ere the dome the arch. He, the dreamer of the dream, saw the vision march. He who has the vision hears more than you may hear. Unseen lips from unseen worlds are bent unto his ear. From the hills beyond the clouds messages are borne, drifting on the dews of dream to his heart of morn. Time awaits and ages stay till he wakes and shows glimpses of the larger life that his vision knows. He who has the vision feels more than you may feel, joy beyond the narrow joy in whose realm we reel for he knows the stars are glad dawn and middle day in the jocund tide that sweeps dark and dusk away he who has the vision lives round and all complete and through him alone we draw dews from combs of sweet end of poem this recording is in the public domain If I Had Known by Alice Ruth Moore Read for LibriVox.org by Celia Ajibu If I had known, two years ago, how drear this life should be, and crowd upon itself all a strangely sad, mayhap another song would burst out from my lips, overflowing with the happiness of future hopes. Mayhap another throb than that of joy have stirred my soul into its innermost depths, if I had known. If I had known, Two years ago, the impotence of love, the vainness of a kiss, how barren a caress, mayhap my soul to higher things have sworn, nor clung to earthly loves and tender dreams, but ever up aloft into the blue imperium, and there to master all the world of mine, if I had known. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Inspiration by Lily Alice Lefebvre A lark sprang up to greet the dawn, close to a rose one day. The tears upon her glowing cheek, his light wing brushed away. Her fragrant beauty fresh and fair he kissed in passing by, and wove her name into his song of rapture in the sky. The lonely rose sighed, Ah, my love, I cannot follow thee. Far, far above in golden light thou hast forgotten me. Yet I am blessed for evermore, though but an instant, dear. Thou singest now a sweeter song for all the world to hear. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Lament 8 by Jan Kochanowski Translated by Dorothea Prahl. Read for LibriVox.org by Piotr Mater. Thou hast made all the house an empty thing, Dear Ursula, by this thy vanishing. Though we are here, tis yet a vacant place, One little soul had filled so great a space. For thou didst sing thy joyousness to all, Running through every nook of house and hall. Thou wouldst not have thy mother grieve, nor let thy father with to solemn thinking fret his head, but thou must kiss them, daughter mine, and all with that entrancing laugh of thine. Now on the house has fallen a dumb blight, thou wilt not come with archness and delight, but every corner lodges lurking grief, and all in vain the heart would seek relief. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Last Word by Matthew Arnold Read for LibriVox.org By Jason DeRocher Creep into thy narrow bed, Creep, and let no more be said. 
Vain thy onset, all stands fast. Thou thyself must break at last. Let the long contention cease. Geese are swans, and swans are geese. Let them have it how they will. Thou out tired, best be still. They out talk thee, hiss thee toward thee. Better men fared thus before thee. Fired their ringing shot and passed, hotly charged, and sank at last. Charge once more, then, and be dumb. Let the victors, when they come, when the forts of folly fall, find thy body by the wall. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Laughing Song by William Blake Read for LibriVox.org by Chad Horner Located in Ballyclare, County Antrim, Northern Ireland when the green woods laugh with the voice of joy, And the dimpling stream runs laughing by, When the air does laugh with our merry wit, And the green hill laughs with the noise of it, When the meadows laugh with lively green, And the grasshopper laughs in the merry scene, When Mary and Susan and Emily With their sweet round mouths sing, Ha ha he! When the painted birds laugh in the shade, where our table with cherries and nuts is spread. Come live and be merry and join with me to sing the sweet chorus of Ha Ha He. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Motherhood by Agnes Lee Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson Mary, the Christ long slain, Pass silently following the children joyously astir under the cedrus and the olive tree, pausing to let their laughter float to her, each voice an echo of a voice more dear. She saw a little Christ in every face. And lo, another woman, gliding near, yearned o'er the tender life that filled the place. And Mary sought the woman's hand and spoke, I know thee not. Yet know thy memory tossed with all a thousand dreams their eyes evoke, who bring to thee a child beloved and lost. I too have rocked my little one. Oh, he was fair, yea, fairer than the fairest sun, and like its rays through amber spun his sun-bright hair. Still I can see it shine and shine. Even so, the woman said, was mine. His ways were ever darling ways, and Mary smiled, so soft, so clinging. Glad relays of love were all his precious days. My little child, my infinite star, my music fled. Even so was mine, the woman said. Then whispered Mary, tell me thou of thine. And she Oh, mine was rosy as a bough, Blooming with roses sent somehow to bloom for me. His balmy fingers left a thrill within my breast, And warms me still. Then gay she down some wilder, darker hour, And said when Mary questioned, knowing not, Who art thou, mother of so sweet a flower? I... In the mother of Iscariot. In the poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Old Year by John Clare. Read for LibriVox.org by Colleen McMahon. The old year's gone away to nothingness and night. We cannot find him all the day, nor hear him in the night. He left no footstep, mark, or place, in either shade or sun. The last year he'd a neighbor's face, in this he's known by none. All nothing everywhere, miss we on morning see, have more of substance when they're here, and more of form than he. He was a friend by every fire, in every cot and hall, a guest to every heart's desire, and now he's not at all. Old papers thrown away, old garments cast aside. The talk of yesterday are things identified. But time once torn away, no voices can recall. 
the eve of New Year's Day left the old year lost to all. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Out, Out by Robert Frost Read for LibriVox.org by M. Lee The buzzsaw snarled and rattled in the yard and made dust and dropped stoveling sticks of wood sweet scented stuff when the breeze drew across it and from there those that lifted eyes could count five mountain ranges one behind the other under the sunset far into vermont and the saw snarled and rattled snarled and rattled as it ran light or had to bear a load and nothing happened day was all but done call it a day i wish they might have said to please the boy by giving him the half hour that a boy counts so much when saved from work his sister stood beside them in her apron to tell them supper at the word the saw as if to prove saws knew what supper meant leaped out at the boy's hand or seemed to leap he must have given the hand however it was neither refused the meeting but the hand the boy's first outcry was a rueful laugh as he swung toward them holding up the hand half in appeal but half as if to keep the life from spilling then the boy saw all since he was old enough to know big boy doing a man's work though a child at heart he saw all spoiled don't let him cut my hand off the doctor when he comes don't let him sister so but the hand was gone already the doctor put him in the dark of ether he lay and puffed his lips out with his breath and then the watcher at his pulse took fright no one believed they listened at his heart little less nothing and that ended it no more to build on there and they since they were not the one dead turned to their affairs end of poem this recording is in the public domain. Oxford by Gerald Gould Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachok I came to Oxford in the light of a spring-colored afternoon. Some clouds were gray and some were white and all were blown to such a tune of quiet rapture in the sky i laughed to see them laughing by i had been dreaming in the train with thoughts at random from my book i looked and read and looked again and suddenly to greet my look oxford shone up with every tower aspiring sweetly like a flower home turned the feet of men that seek and home the hearts of children turn and none can teach the hour to speak what every hour is free to learn and all discover late or soon their golden oxford afternoon end of poem this recording is in the public domain the route march by Henry Lawson. Read for LibriVox.org by Rachel May. Did you hear the children singing, O oh my brothers? Did you hear the children singing as our troops went marching past, in the sunshine and the rain, as they'll never sing again? Hear the little schoolgirls singing as our troops went swinging past. Did you hear the children singing, O oh my brothers? Did you hear the children singing for the first man and the last? as they marched away and vanished to a tune we thought was banished. Did you hear the children singing for the future and the past? Shall you hear the children singing, O oh my brothers? Shall you hear the children singing in the sunshine or the rain? 
There'll be sobs beneath the ringing of the cheers and neath the singing. There'll be tears of orphan children when our boys come back again. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Silver Filigree by Eleanor Wiley. Read for LibriVox.org by Sam Bartle. The icicles wreathing on trees in festoon swing swayed to our breathing. They're made of the moon. She's a pale waxen taper, and these seem to drip transparent as paper from the flame of her tip. Molten, smoking a little. Into crystal they pass, falling, freezing, to brittle and delicate glass. Each a sharp pointed flower, each a brief stalactite, which hangs for an hour in the blue cave of night. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Soap Bubbles by Herbert Miller Hopkins Read for LibriVox by Ted Hanlon As a little child at play blows upon a pipe of clay, Bubbles, evanescent bright, with their iridescent light, So I fling upon the wind verses of the bubble kind. And my friend with eyes of blue looks my dainty verses through, Pauses from his books a while, with an intellectual smile, for my fancy seems as naught to this man of deeper thought. Still I plead as my excuse, even bubbles have their use, they are perfect while they live, and their short career may give, as they shimmer and are flown, some suggestion for our own. Let their beauty, pure and glad, make another soul less sad, and, as upward they are whirled, let them show their little world. Floating clouds and perfect sky, Warmly mirrored ere they die. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet 19 When I Consider How My Light Is Spent by John Milton Read for LibriVox.org by Phil Schempf When I consider how my light is spent ere half my days in this dark world and wide and that one talent which is death to hide lodged with me useless though my soul more bent to serve therewith my maker and present my true account lest he returning chide doth god exact day labour light denied i fondly ask but patience to prevent that murmur soon replies God doth not need either man's work or his own gifts. Who best bear his mild yoke, they serve him best. His state is kingly. Thousands at his bidding speed and post o'er land and ocean without rest. They also serve who only stand and wait. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet 97 How Like a Winter Hath My Absence Been by William Shakespeare Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp How like a winter hath my absence been from thee, the pleasure of the fleeting year? What freezings have I felt, what dark days seen, what old December's bareness everywhere? and yet this time removed was summer's time the teeming autumn big with rich increase bearing the wanton burden of the prime like widowed wombs after their lord's decease yet this abundant issue seemed to me but hope of orphans and unfathered fruit for summer and his pleasures wait on thee and thou away the very birds are mute or if they sing "'Tis with so dull a cheer that leaves look pale, "'drudding the winter's near.'" End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Spectres by Thomas Hall Shasted 
Read for LibriVox.org by Andrew Gauntz. In a palace sad and lonely flit two specters all the day, specters chasing joy and brightness from each window far away. One is sorrow clad in raiment, somber as the shades of night, while her trailing robes of darkness chase away each ray of light. But the other one is envy, clad in blackness, clad with woe, sorrow's only sad companion, flitting ever to and fro. By the windows ever gliding, filling all with thoughts of pain, all who gaze are doomed forever, ne'er to see bright joy again. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Stone by Wilfred Wilson Gibson Read for LibriVox.org by Phil Schampf And will you cut a stone for him to set above his head? And will you cut a stone for him? A stone for him, she said. Three days before, a splintered rock had struck her lover dead, had struck him in the quarry dead, where, careless of the warning call, he loitered while the shot was fired a lively stripling brave and tall and sure of all his heart desired a flash a shock a rumbling fall and broken neath the broken rock a lifeless heap with face of clay and still as any stone he lay with eyes that saw the end of all i went to break the news to her and i could hear my own heart beat with dread of what my lips might say but some poor fool had sped before and flinging wide her father's door had blurted out the news to her had struck her lover dead for her had struck the girl's heart dead in her had struck life lifeless at a word and dropped it at her feet then hurried on his witless way scarce knowing she had heard and when i came she stood alone a woman turned to stone and though no word at all she said i knew that all was known because her heart was dead she did not sigh nor moan her mother wept she could not weep her lover slept she could not sleep three days three nights she did not stir three days three nights were one to her who never closed her eyes from sunset to sunrise from dawn to even fall her tearless staring eyes that seeing not saw all the fourth night when i came from work i found her at my door and will you cut a stone for him she said and spoke no more but followed me as i went in and sank upon a chair and fixed her gray eyes on my face with still unseeing stare and as she waited patiently i could not bear to feel those still gray eyes that followed me those eyes that pluck the heart from me those eyes that suck the breath from me and curdled the warm blood in me those eyes that cut me to the bone and pierced my marrow like cold steel and so i rose and sought a stone and cut it smooth and square and as i worked she sat and watched beside me in her chair night after night by candlelight i cut her lover's name night after night so still and white and like a ghost she came and sat beside me in her chair and watched with eyes of flame she eyed each stroke and hardly stirred she never spoke a single word and not a sound or murmur broke the quiet save the mallet stroke with still eyes ever on my hands with eyes that seemed to burn my hands my wincing over wearied hands she watched with bloodless lips apart and silent indrawn breath and every stroke my chisel cut death cut still deeper in her heart the two of us were chiseling together i and death and when at length the job was done and i had laid the mallet by as if at last her peace were won she breathed his name and with a sigh passed slowly through the open door and never crossed my threshold more next night i labored late alone to cut her name upon the stone 
End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Teacher's If by R. J. Gale. Read for LibriVox.org. The Teacher's If. If you can take your dreams into the classroom and always make them part of each day's work, if you can face the countless petty problems, nor turn from them, nor ever try to shirk, if you can live so that the child you work with deep in his heart knows you to be a man, if you can take I can't from out his language and put in place a vigorous I can if you can take love with you into the classroom and yet on firmness never shut the door if you can teach a child the love of nature so that he helps himself to all her store if you can teach him life is what we make it that he himself can be his only bar if you can tell him something of the heavens or something of the wonder of a star if you with simple bits of truth and honor his better self occasionally reach yet not overdo nor have him dub you as one who is inclined to ever preach if you impart to him a bit of liking for all the wondrous things we find in print yet have him understand that to be happy play exercise fresh air he must not stint if you can give of all the best that's in you and in the giving always happy be if you can find the good that's hidden somewhere deep in the heart of every child you see if you can do these things and all the others that teachers everywhere do every day you're in the work that you were surely meant for take hold of it know it's your place and stay End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. They are all gone into the world of light by Henry Vaughan. Read for LibriVox.org by Phil Schempf. They are all gone into the world of light, and I alone sit lingering here. Their very memory is fair and bright, and my sad thoughts doth clear. It glows and glitters in my cloudy breast, like stars upon some gloomy grove, or those faint beams in which this hill is dressed after the sun's remove. I see them walking in an air of glory, whose light doth trample on my days, my days which are at best but dull and hoary, mere glimmering and decays. O oh, holy hope! and high humility high as the heavens above these are your walks and you have showed them me to kindle my cold love dear beauteous death the jewel of the just shining nowhere but in the dark what mysteries do lie beyond thy dust could man outlook that mark he that hath found some fledged bird's nest may know at first sight if the bird be flown but what fair well or grove he sings in now that is to him unknown and yet as angels in some brighter dreams call to the soul when man doth sleep so some strange thoughts transcend our wanted themes and into glory peep if a star were confined into a tomb her captive flames must needs burn there but when the hand that locked her up gives room she'll shine through all the sphere o father of eternal life and all created glories under thee resume thy spirit from this world of thrall into true liberty either disperse these mists which blot and fill my perspective still as they pass or else remove me hence unto that hill where i shall need no glass end of poem this recording is in the public domain To His Mistress Going to Bed by John Dunn Read for LibriVox.org by Chad Horner Located in Liverpool, England Come, madam, come, all rest, my powers defy 
until I labour, I in labour lie. The foe oft times having the foe in sight, is tired with standing though he never fight. Off with that girdle, like heaven's sown, glistering, but a far fairer world encompassing. Unpin that spangled breastplate which you wear, that the eyes of busy fools may be stopped there. Unlace yourself for that harmonious chime tells me from you that now it is bedtime. Off with that happy busk which I envy, that still can be and still can stand so nigh. Your gown going off, such beauteous state reveals as when from flowery meads the hills shadow steals. Off with that wiry coronet and show the hairy diadem which on you doth grow. Now off with those shoes and then safely tread in this love's hallowed temple, this soft bed. In such white robes, heaven's angels used to be received by men. Thy angel bringest with thee a heaven like Mohammed's paradise. And though ill spirits walk in white, we easily know by this these angels from an evil sprite. Those set our hairs, but these are flesh upright. License my roving hands and let them go, before, behind, between, above, below. O oh, my America, my new found land, my kingdom, safeliest when with one man manned. My mine of precious stones, my empire, how blessed am I in this discovering thee. To enter in these bonds is to be free. Then where my hand is set, my seal shall be. Full nakedness, all joys are due to thee. As souls unbodied, bodies unclothed must be. To taste whole joys. Gems which you women use are like Atlantis balls, cast in men's hues. That when a fool's eye lighteth on a gem, his earthly soul may covet theirs, not them. Like pictures or like books, gay coverings made, for lay men are all women thus arrayed. Themselves are mystic books, which only we, whom their imputed grace will dignify, must see revealed. Then, since that I may know, as liberally as to a midwife, show thyself. Cast all, yea, this white linen hence, there is no penance due to innocence. To teach thee I am naked first, why, then, what needest thou have more covering than a man? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To the Forgotten Dead by Margaret Louisa Woods Read for LibriVox.org by Newgate Novelist To the Forgotten Dead Come, let us drink in silence ere we part To every fervent yet resolved heart That brought its tameless passion and its tears Renunciation and laborious years to lay the deep foundations of our race, to rear its mighty ramparts overhead, and light its pinnacles with golden grace, to the unhonoured dead. To the forgotten dead, whose dauntless hands were stretched to grasp the rein of fate, and hurl into the void again her thunder-hoofed horses, Rushing blind earthward along the courses of the wind. Among the stars, along the wind, in vain their souls were scattered, and their blood was shed, and nothing, nothing of them doth remain. To the thrice perished dead. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Trial of the Dead by Lydia Howard Sigourney Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia The Trial of the Dead The solemn mockery of the trial of the dead, which was first permitted in Scotland about the 14th century, was exhibited in the case of George Gordon, Earl of Huntley, in the year 1664. 
after this judicial process the body was removed from holyrood and interred at elgin castle the burial place of his family the spears at corrigy were bright where with a stern command the earl of huntley ranged his host upon their native strand from many a highland strath and glen they at his summons came a stalwart band of fearless men who counted war a game then from edina's royal court fierce murray northward sped and rushed his envied foe to meet in battle sharp and dread they met they closed they struggled sore like waves when tempests blow the slogan music high in air the sound of groans below they broke they wheeled they charged again till on the ensanguined ground the noble gordon lifeless lay transpierced with many a wound long from her tower his lady looked i see a dusky cloud and there behold comes floating high earl huntley's banner proud then deep she sighed for rising mist involved her aching sight twas but an autumn bough that mocked her chieftain's pennon bright his mother by the ingle sate her head upon her knee and murmured low in hollow tone he'll never come back to thee his lady mother hear i not steed tramp and pebble roar as when the victor surf doth tread upon a rocky shore not toward the loophole raised her head that woman wise and hoar but whispered in her troubled soul thy lord returns no more a funeral march is in my ear a scattered host i see and straining wild her sunken eye gazed out on vacancy back to their homes the gordon clan stole with despairing tread while to the walls of holyrood was born their chieftain dead exulting foemen bore him there while lawless vessels jeered nor spared to mock the haughty brow whose living frown they feared no earth upon his course they strewed at no rich shrine inurned but heavenward as the warrior fell his noble forehead turned months fled and while from castled height to cot in lowly dell over corrigy's disastrous day the tears of scotland fell behold a high and solemn court with feudal pomp was graced and at the bar in princely robes a muffled chieftain placed no glance his veiled face might scan though throngs beside him pressed the golden plume his brow adorned his tartan wrapped his breast lord george of gordon huntley's earl high treason taints thy name for god and for thy country's cause defend thine ancient fame make oath upon thine honour's seal heaven's truth unblenching tell no lip he moved no hand he raised and dire that silence fell no word he spake though thrice adjured then came the sentence drear foul traitor to thy queen and realm our laws denounced thee here they stripped him of his cloak of state they bared his helmet head though the pale judges inly quaked before the ghastly dead light thing to him that earthly doom or man's avenging rod who in the land of souls doth bide the audit of his god before his face the crowd drew back as from sepulchral gloom and sternest veterans shrank to breathe the vapour of the tomb and now this mockery of the dead with hateful pageant o'er they yield him to his waiting friends who throng the palace door and on their sad procession pressed unresting day and night to where mid elgin's towers they mark the fair cathedral's height and there by kindred tears bedewed beneath its hallowed shade with midnight torch and chanted dirge their fallen sheaf they laid fast by king duncan's mouldering dust whose locks of silver hue were stained as evan's swan hath sung with murder's bloody dew so rest thou here thou scottish earl of ancient fame and power no more a valiant host to guide in battle's stormy hour 
yea rest thee here thou scottish earl until that day of dread which to eternity consigns the trial of the dead end of poem this recording is in the public domain a tribute to dunbar by edward smythe jones read for LibriVox.org by larry wilson the sweetest singer once thou wast but art no more an elf thou wast of what thou now shalt be where thou art in realms of that celestial shore there thou shalt sing through all eternity we peerless bard bewail thy loss and shed heart-broken tears though meekly thou hast borne thy cross and winged the flight of years thrice blessed singer wrapped in heavenly bliss of earth's poor souls thy fortune who can tell perchance thy splendid lot be solely this to change thy lute with the angel israfel if so then smite thy golden strings with fingers nimble strong till all along fair heaven rings with cadence of thy song thee tyrant earth once held imprisoned soul that suffered tortures of relentless strife fair heaven now holds within her sheltered fold and gives thee robe and harp eternal life grant him o god unfaltering breath to sing from heaven afar a song to cheer our souls in death the peerless paul dunbar in the poem this recording is in the public domain twilight by margaret louisa woods read for LibriVox.org by newgate novelist come let us go for now the gray and silent eve is low the river reaches gleam and dimly blue in windings of the stream its heavy rushes bow the day is past, the world is dreaming now, the world is dreaming now, let us too dream. And dreaming be the vision of our souls like this we see, where unsubstantial skies blend with the earth's obscure realities. Let us recall the blind, forewandered years, and round their temples bind fresh coronals of lovelier memories. For dreaming here, we shall remember joys that never were, that might and might not be. One rich remembrance with its alchemy transmuting all time's store, till the sad years exult and deem they bore only the long, long love twixt thee and me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Upon Eckington Bridge, River Avon, by Arthur Quiller Cooch read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk. O pastoral heart of England, like a psalm of green days telling with a quiet beat, O wave into the sunset flowing calm, O tired lark descending on the wheat, lies it all peace beyond that western fold, where now the lingering shepherd sees his star rise upon malvern paints an age of gold yon cloud with prophecies of linked ease lulling this land with hills drawn up like knees to drowse beside her implements of war man shall outlast his battles they have swept avon from naseby field to severn ham and evesham's dedicated stones have stepped down to the dust with montfort's oriflamme nor the red tear nor the reflected tower abides but yet these eloquent grooves remain 
worn in the sandstone parapet hour by hour by laboring bargemen where they shifted ropes e'en so shall man turn back from violent hopes to adam's cheer and toil with spade again ay and his mother nature to whose lap like a repentant child at length he hies not in the whirlwind or the thunderclap proclaims her more tremendous mysteries but when in winter's grave bereft of light with still small voice divinelier whispering lifting the green head of the aconite feeding with sap of hope the hazel shoot she feels god's finger active at the root turns in her sleep and murmurs of the spring end of poem this recording is in the public domain the victory that overcometh the world by handley mole read for LibriVox.org by in the desert the church that sojourns in this world at rome to the corinthian and athenian saints and our philippian brethren and the flock of thessalonian wayfarers and all beyond the further waters wheresoe'er in asia troas the beloved paul taught without rest the everlasting name grace mercy and peace from him who cannot change and from our lord his son who gave himself our ransom and for us is risen again the firstborn from the grave to whom we look for white robed triumphs and the crown of life after these present things through faith in him beloved weep not over much to know that paul is fallen asleep this evil world has wreaked indeed her last on him and worst the precious vessel of our master's choice our golden lamp of truth the starry flame whose radiant guidance through the depth of night even to its setting led us toward the port and coasts of promised glory still unseen he sleeps indeed and we amidst the waves wander alone yet not alone for still our life once slain now risen is always near death has no more dominion over him we write not now of deeds long memorable in every land since the red flood of fire unlooked for unresisted overflowed this babylon beneath the western heavens when the great adversary's craft prevailed to turn the pagan vengeance fierce and full upon the guiltless church ye too have felt the scourge ye too may reckon many a friend imprisoned vexed tormented slain for christ yes from your shores it was from your embrace from troas hitherward and ephesus the blessed paul was wafted chained for death when the young spring last flowered the isles and hills but how he fared at rome how in our sight he overcame and reached eternal peace this now we write imparting pain and joy pain for our orphanhood but much more joy not for his entrance only but for ours and yours his glorious death so lifts the veil when first the saint conveyed by ruthless hands arriving in the dungeon's hollow gloom lay worn and lone we sought a while in vain to enter and attend him the stern guards oft warned us thence with threats of chain and flame as wizards traitors a vile alien crew incendiary sworn enemies of men yet we returned entreating and our lord who all things can touching with secret power those violent souls in mercy gave us leave entering to gather round his saint once more embracing and consoling twas by night stealthy by torchlight threading a dim path through winding lanes while now the watery wind rolled clouds on clouds across the setting moon and showered the city six the brethren were six only led with trembling hearts far down under the frown of archers stair by stair solemn his greeting was a voice indeed affectionate and dignity of years and loftiest wisdom tempered the sad sound 
but passing mournful, and the glimmering flames that hung above him in the unrestful cell touched the dark furrows of his careworn brow and faded face, not seldom in mid-speech, with sudden pause abrupt the words expired, until at length collecting thought and will for fuller voice he hushed at once our grief, and broken utterance of imperfect hopes, for well we knew the glance and gaze profound, bent toward us yet beyond, thus oft of old, in that thronged chamber by the Tiber stream, he stilled the wrangling tongues and took the word, Ascendant, it is well that ye are here, yea, blessed on either hand, ye are come to-night to see not Paul but our great Lord in chains, and reap his promised welcome in the hour of judgment, and I also hail in you his visitation, my spiritual gloom, is touched again from heaven, the Lord is near, the shepherd walking in the vale of death, O oh, timely presence, for the clouds have fallen, as once they never fell, the ancient foe has had his leave, his last and terrible hour, with baneful magic summoning from hell a multitudinous and threatening throng of visionary fears, long since he showed on the lone hill of trial to our king, the world in glory dressed, but now to me its darkness, force, and hatred dreadful view. This evil world, in varying guise it rose, to haunt me sometimes in the mask of power, the Roman semblance pitiless and strong, for now at length, beloved, around us wakes no transient burst of blind and partial zeal, but the great empire's anger at the thought I have inly trembled with the palsied thrill of undefended weakness miserable. For I, long travelled o'er the peopled world, always familiar with the seals and signs, of this imperial polity so vast, in circuit, nor unjust, and wise withal in this life's wisdom, feared it but the more, now hostile, well nigh as the pagan bows, to fate and strives no longer. Oft in turn came other terrors, threatening from beneath, innumerable voices heard of old, in Ephesus or Corinth or the school of Athens, faces arrogant and fixed, in mental pride, or heavy with a cloud, of self-deluding doubts, or worse than these, gay and in sportive mood, with jest and smile, ill-suiting thoughts that would dissolve away, all truth, all being, earth alike, and heaven. Vain errors, but methought so deep entwined, with this world's inmost root, so interfused, with human speech and social mode, and forms of art and culture old and beautiful, it seemed a moment that for ever now this must be so, a set necessity. Nor seldom on my spirit, but oftener far, and heavier fell the mystery of sin. The world's huge malady forces manifold, acting and interacting with result, incessant, ever various, all instinct, with falsehood, hatred, shame, motion that seems self-moved, or finding everywhere a cause to energize and lend its scope and range, present in all things, in the streets alike, and wildernesses, in the stir of marts and havens, in the scholar's porch and bower, nay, from the assembly of the ransomed saints, not absent where to aid the restless springs, of inborn ill, even now the lying glows, of false-named knowledge whispers in the ear, to Christ's weak followers, weaving godless dreams, of depths and ages, generations drear, of unsubstantial being, alien all, from the dear cross and holiness and heaven. And slow the while and toilsome is the task of healing. Few the souls that find the way, as though the ill were even the ground of things, and the pure good an accident, a cloud, drawn round it for a season here and there, to vanish in an hour. And in the straits, of such temptation much the pangs of time, this world's incessant stream and lapsing change, troubled my spirit in old age at last. Remembrances long silent woke within, old voices and the light of buried eyes, with hopeless farewells from remotest years, things till that hour felt only while I felt, as tenderly and full the eternal hope, 
all cheering, all renewing, now alone. I felt the dark world's flux in all things soar, in clouds and rolling waves, in walls and hills, naught but the march of death in that weak hour. So while he spoke and poured his inmost soul with tears before us, we too wept around. For we recalled the better years late flown, when to his chamber prison, not uncheered, by friendship's free access and reverent love, he drew his throng of listeners, young and old, and bond and free were there, captain and sage and senator, pagan and proselyte. A moving scene of life and pregnant power, while to the height of heavenward argument he pleaded, still with affluent proofs far drawn, presenting as the reason of all hope, the justifying blood and Jesus risen. But soon again he stayed our silent shower. Weep not, though I have wept, it was my choice, deliberate thus to unfold my soul's last strife. For think not that the Lord's prophetic call exempts his servants from the lot of man, sorrows and secret groans and battle waged, with visible things. I have spoken, and the while, even as I deemed it should be, lo, the joy of changeless truth, divine reality, in full persuasion healing all my pains, springs in this fainting heart and flows profound. But now farewell, the starry watchers move. Tomorrow in the Emilian Hall, if so, our Lord permit, I plead at Caesar's chair, accused by Alexander on the charge of majesty and plots of fire at Rome. There he who promised shall renew my strength, to him this night be glory and beyond, all night, all time, to him be glory still, who rising once has overcome the world. We now are weak in him, but we shall live through him in power and immortality. Yea, we shall reign forever with the Lord. So from the vault again to upper night, and the free air we climbed, revolving much the import of his words and all the strife which in this world the suffering truth must bear, with sin and pain and time. But when the sun, upspringing, showered the diamond rays of morn on air and earth, then to the Emilian Hall we sped, with divided fears and hopes, unmarked, amidst the concourse, for the place was thronging aisle and gallery. We drew near the chair of judgment, even as we came, the prince himself to the tribunal moved, in purple, ushered in by giant forms, barbarians, children of the fair-haired north, and following came the gowned retinue long of counsellors, the majesty of Rome. Long while the accuser pleaded harsh and keen with treasured malice, urging proof on proof, of treachery sown in secret far and near, and of the city's conflagration planned by Paul and kindled at a Christian torch. And much he spoke of stubborn purposes, rebellious and the incense cloud refused at Caesar's altar, what from such a seed should spring but ruin, disillusion, dire, of the world's commonwealth and Roman peace. He spoke and stayed, and all the audience moved, tumultuous murmurs as of rising winds, anger and terror. Then at length in turn, before the judgment seat, he stood alone, the blessed one, the beloved, white with age, bent by the ruthless iron, and now by those who once could aid, forsaken, none was there, in that stern hour, of all whose eloquent lips and skill of law full fain in other days had succoured him so needing all were gone, or silent, such the terror of the time. But wonderful it was to see and hear himself left solitary, in act to speak, he stood erect, with lifted countenance of cheerful dignity and gaze intent on Caesar, then with soul-compelling words, now brief, now rich in splendid amplitude, this way and that he broke the accuser's snare, till fast again the murmurs of the throng in other mood were rising, and the voice of muttering converse spoke him innocent of every crime. But ere the close it seemed to us with steadfast eyes watching each change, that on his face a sudden radiance shone, not of the vernal sun through pillared aisles, 
nor cast afar from shield or lustrous gem, but from above our transient brightness thrown, as if beside him one invisible, standing and speaking, drew the old man's gaze, attentive meeting it with smiles of light, and while it shone once more a sound of power, swelled in his voice he gathered yet once more the argument to lift its line to heaven, and before Caesar and the silent ring of princes and the gorgeous ranks aloft of matrons, while the throngs on every side stood at the sound and nearer leaned to hear, he bore his long last witness to the truth of Jesus. Much he reasoned of the Lord, much of himself, his youthful enmity, the ethereal flame before Damascus seen, the voice and visible presence, thence his change, instant and final, with all heaven to come. And hear me yet, Augustus, yet this once, he whom I saw that hour is with me now, in other mode, but in himself the same, the crucified, the eternal, whom I serve. By him again, in weakness I am strong, by him, in this extremest solitude, I walk with infinite companionship, around me from the ruins of old age, by him I spring into eternal youth, redeemed and justified and glorified after his will, by him as from a throne. I look upon this world not with the glance of apathy or self-dependent pride, but in full peace of knowledge and of love, meekly victorious, I have felt and weighed thy power, imperial master of a world, and yours, ye sages of all alien law, and yours, ye multitudes, for whom he died. Workers of ill and sufferers, till well nigh, my shrinking heart has wavered and refused the invisible hope. But now that fear is past, and here again in open confidence, lo, I commit myself and with myself, all cares, all human bonds, yea, all mankind, all creatures, depth and height and life and death, to him whom I believe. There all is well. Because he rose and conquered, all is well. Past things and this dread present and the range of long futurity all rests with him, to whom all knees shall bend when at the last, fulfilling every promise given of old, through seers and kings he shall return again to final doom and triumph. Then shall we, whoever have loved his coming, and through him have borne the evil day and this dire world, receive the longed-for welcome to his bliss. Bearing the palms of heaven and righteous crown, he ceased, and brighter still the mystic light, as from a radiant cloud issuing more fair, shone on his lifted forehead, silence long, controlled the multitudes in strange amaze, held captive prince and people, thoughts and voice, mute as they also saw the things unseen, and sure in him who spoke they saw revealed, the long withholden secret of the life, eternal gazing on that lonely man, who in a serene region distant far, from idle creeds and earth-born wisdom blind, walked in their presence with the Lord of life, the friend divine. So silence owned the spell, even after, when himself shall speak, returning, the loud world shall hush her cry, dread silence and supreme. But now at length the stillness broke in movement, for the prince rose sudden, bidding herald voices clear, proclaim the man acquitted on the charge of conflagration, but arraigned again for other crimes, then turned in careless mood, so seeming, and begirt with rods and steel, passed to the palace. On the nuns of May, this judgment sate, wherein the Lord himself, with light ineffable and present grace, upheld his saint. Since then the lingering hours rolled on their number, night by night we met, in the deep vault where Luke with faithful love entreated and prevailed to share with Paul both nights and days, and thence at his behest plied pen again and tablets to beseech the coming of Timotheus, but in vain shall now Timotheus come, when June was full, Caesar then absent in the Archaean towns, came the last summons to the Blessed One, 
to answer, Helios sitting in the chair, but profitless that answer for the judge, violent and all unequal, curtained round, in secret conclave resolute for blood, did but revile the saint and haste him out to instant doom, while Paul no other word spoke but high praise and cheerful thanks to him, who thus at length delivered him through death from death for ever. Twas in depth of dawn they led him forth when the stars paled aloft, and all the fields were dusk, far off we went, without the gate upon the Ostian road, and Ardiatine, till now the place of death, a hollow field wet with a threefold well, appeared before us, Paul along the way, spoke much in marvellous joy, we wept again. He, tender but untearful as for whom the Lord's presence thrilled all thoughts with love, but into bliss exhaled the fount of grief, stepped on with youthful vigour and discoursed largely of endless hopes with mingled strains, of ancient memory dear and mention made, of distant friends he soon should hail in life. At last with brief thanksgiving for his soul, hasted to go, he knelt, and while we stood, with eyes averted met the sword, and died, say rather lived beyond the world, with him who overcame the world, far better state. Just at sunrise he left us when far off, on the eastward verge of hills the earliest fire looked forth in morning glory swift and strong. Near to the place of death his body lies, buried by us, oft round the blessed grave, if so the persecutor's wrath permit, we mean to gather, when the shadows fall, or noontide stillness consecrates the field, to sing our praises not to the dear dead, though venerable, but rather to his name, who is our life and victory, whose sure hour of promised resurrection, soon or late, draws near and nearer with the rolling suns. Meantime, be it ours and yours, with duteous tears, and heavenward thought to greet the blessed one gone, but more to greet and ponder and hold fast his heaven-revealing gospel with repose, even to the end of joyful faith on him who died and lived again, for since he lives, we live with him, and shall with him prevail. Farewell, we greet you in the peace of Christ, your Roman kindred few for many named, Eubulus, Lucas, Onesiphorus, Linus and Claudia, partners of one hope, I, Pudens, who have written, lately come from this world's darkness and the pride of life, salute you in our Lord, to him be praise. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. When As a Lad by Isabel Ecclestone McKay. Read for LibriVox.org by Ike Sher. When As a Lad at break of day I watched the fishers sail away, my thoughts like flocking birds would follow. Across the curving sky's blue hollow, And on, and on, Into the very heart of dawn. For long I searched the world, Ah, me! I searched the sky, I searched the sea, With much of useless grief and ruing, Those winged thoughts of mine pursuing. So dear were they, so lovely, And so far away. I seek them still, and always will, until my laggard heart is still, and I am free to follow, follow across the curving sky's blue hollow, those thoughts too fleet for any, save the soul's swift feet. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Widow of Nain by Jane Jewell Weller Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia The Widow of Nain Her last hope is riven, dark despair fills her heart. To the grave, to the grave, it is there they must part. In the stupor of sorrow she follows the bier, when lo, mercy's accents fall soft on her ear. Weep not, says the stranger, she looks with surprise. 
he touches the bier and young man arise resounds from his lips and lo at his call the dead man sat up and great fear fell on all and who is this stranger at whose mighty word stern death is thus vanquished tis jehovah the lord it is he who from heaven at mercy's appeal descended with balm all earth's sorrows to heal and still he is present still waits to be kind the afflicted to comfort hearts broken to bind and still may we hear him in sorrow's lone lot breathing forth in kind accents trust in me and fear not end of poem this recording is in the public domain a winter night by sarah teasdale read for librivox.org by sam bartle my window pane is starred with frost the world is bitter cold to-night the moon is cruel and the wind is like a two-edged sword to smite god pity all the homeless ones the beggars pacing to and fro god pity all the poor to-night who walk the lamplit streets of snow my room is like a bit of june warm and close curtained fold on fold but somewhere like a homeless child my heart is crying in the cold end of poem this recording is in the public domain winter rain by christina rossetti read for LibriVox.org by am lee every valley drinks every dell and hollow where that kind rain sinks and sinks green of spring will follow yet a lapse of weeks buds will burst their edges strip their wool coats glue coat streaks in the woods and hedges weave a bower of love for birds to meet each other weave a canopy above nest and egg and mother but for fattening rain we should have no flowers never a bud or leaf again but for soaking showers never a mated bird in the rocking treetops never indeed a flock or herd to graze upon the leaf crops lamb so woolly white sheep the sun bright leaves on they could have no grass to bite but for rain and season we should find no moss in the shadiest places find no waving meadow grass pied with broad-eyed daisies but miles of barren sand with never a son or daughter not a lily on the land or lily on the water and a poem this recording is in the public domain the yellow hammer by david gray read for librivox dot org by sonia the yellow hammer in fairy glen of woody lee one sunny summer morning i plucked a little birchen tree the spongy moss adorning and bearing it delighted home i planted it in garden loam where perfecting all duty it flowered in tesselled beauty when delicate april in each dell was silently completing her ministry in bud and bell to grace the summer's meeting my birchen tree of glossy rind determined not to be behind so with a subtle power the buds began to flower and i could watch from out my house the twigs with leaflets thicken from glossy rind to twining boughs the milky sap can quicken and when the fragrant form was green no fairer tree was to be seen all garch or woods adorning where doves are always mourning but never dove with liquid wing or neck of changeful gleaming came near my garden tree to sing or crudle out its meaning but this sweet day an hour ago a yellow hammer clear and low in love and tender pity thrilled out his dainty ditty 
and i was pleased as you may think and blessed the little singer oh fly for your mate to luggy brink dear little bird and bring her and build your nest among the boughs a sweet and cosy little house where ye may well content ye since true love is so plenty and when she sits upon her nest here are cool shades to shroud her at this the singer sang his best oh louder yet and louder until i shouted in my glee his song had so enchanted me no nightingale could pant on in joy so wise and wanton but at my careless noise he flew and if he chanced to bring her a happy bride the summer through mong birchen boughs to linger i'll sing to you in numbers high a summer song that shall not die but keep in memory clearly the bird i love so dearly end of poem this recording is in the public domain zanesville by jean star untermeyer recorded for LibriVox.org by jen warren i will not be like the unaspiring hills whence the sour clay is taken to be molded by the shape-loving fingers of man into vases and cups of an old pattern but i will be my own creator dragging myself from the clinging mud and mold myself into fresh and lovelier shapes to celebrate my passion for beauty end of poem this recording is in the public domain